Exploring the Bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, ghosts, lost worlds, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Giddy up, aliens. Giddy up, Mothman. Giddy up, all you cryptids out there. Ah, oh my God. This is, this is the final roundup. The final roundup for... 2017. Yahoo! Hello there, Tim Schwartz in frozen Jasper, Indiana. Ah, uh-huh. Tim, whip it good there. Oh, oh, yeah, you know, I know how to use that whip. 50, <laughs> shade, 50 Shades of Grey takes on all new meetings here. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> whip it so it doesn't leave a mark. There you go. So what's going on, Tim? What's going on out there? Oh, well, we're having a heat wave right now. I mean, uh, yesterday, uh, was it? No, a couple, uh, yesterday and the day before, it, it didn't get up to like oh, above seven degrees. Now, today, today we had a high of 23. So, you know, that's like, yeah, that's livable. You know, go out and start planting crops. Oh, you be, <laughs> you, what kind of crops would you be planting? <laughs> Uh, Let's pass them. Maybe we can increase our audience if we promise the, uh, to pass out some of those crops, right? There you go. Oh, yeah, sure. Here in Indiana. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> anyway, they, this, this is they, our end of the year roundup. That's right. And, and we've got on some guests that are going to help us. Uh, rope and hog tie some of them critters out there, whether they be from terra firma or from somewhere out yon. Arr, giddy up! Yeah. <laughs> giddy up, Tim. Tell us who we got on tonight. Well, we've got uh, um, some old friends with us uh, uh, tonight. We have uh, uh, Greg Bishop. Uh, from uh, Radio Mysterioso, and uh, we have uh, Alon uh, uh, Strickler of uh, the Phantoms and Monsters uh, website, and we're just uh, uh, happy to have them uh, uh, back with us to uh, uh, join us. And then uh, later on uh, in the program, uh, uh, T. Allen Greenfield, your good friend, and uh, and and now mine. But I mean, you've known him a lot longer than uh, than me. You know, we we have known Alan. We, uh, I have known Alan. Uh, since we were both, oh geez, what behind the ear? I, I don't know. We were we were <laughs> so young. I mean, like uh, you know, I, I really young. I don't know, fifteen years old or or something like that. And uh, we used to actually meet at this time of the year. Alan would come to New York, and uh, we would meet with um, some of the other locals, including uh, Gene Steinberg. Uh, in a hotel room, uh, Alan's hotel room, and we would say, stay up and chat uh, all night long, just like we're going to do tonight. In fact, what are we going to do, uh, Tim? How, how are we going to approach this tonight? I guess we're going to uh, take on some of the uh, topics that have uh, uh, provided uh, the uh, our audience and the, the world at large uh, with the uh, interesting uh, the subject that matters as far as the paranormal uh, uh, goes, wouldn't you say? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, things that uh, that all of us uh, found uh, found interesting or or boring or just more of the same old uh, bull or or or, or, <laughs> yeah, or, 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 or overhyped. Oh yeah, definitely overhyped. <laughs> overhyped, uh, overhyped, and ripe. <laughs> well, I don't know where. What, uh, what, where should we start the discussion? Do you think, Tim, with the big news of the last uh, few weeks, disclosure? Uh, yeah, I suppose we have to. <laughs> but I mean, this, this well, disclosure isn't. Uh, that's that. That's not really a, a correct term. At least not no. according to you know. No. I mean, you know, you go by like all these you know 
disclose your bozos, you know, who think that the government, you know, are hiding these you know, deep, uh, and nice. you know, hiding these deep dark secrets uh, uh, out there. I mean, this is this is just more, you know, to me, it, it really is. It's it's just more of the same. I mean, that uh, this 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 article saying that uh, that yeah, you know, at one point the government once again, you know, conducted uh, a research on uh, UFO sightings, in particular, you know, with uh, um, uh, pilots and other military personnel. Uh, but but once again, at least so far, it's just you know, like a lot of. Uh, a uh, 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 smoke, but ultimately no fire. Well, now, you know, I, I have to take a little bit of uh, opposing position on, on okay. this one. Uh, no, Tim. you can't do that. Uh, yes, I I'll, can. I'll just, I'll just uh, sign. Goodbye. Well, <laughs> go, go ahead. Go no, ahead. No, I, I, I do believe that this is a substantial revelation. Uh, now, whether, whether this will uh, hold uh, fire uh, and and burn the uh, the ambers there uh, even longer remains to be seen. But um, I just heard uh, uh, Leslie uh, uh, K uh, Keen is it on the on the um, radio? Uh, I guess today or yesterday, and right. she's working on a second uh, piece for the New York Times, which will contain more information and another video, and will be released. Uh, uh, sometime after the first of the uh, the year, so there is another scoop coming, and, and I do believe that uh, the uh, the big news here, regardless of the disclosure, is the fact that the New York Times would run a piece like this on the front page. I mean, uh, of course, we know that everybody's uh, printed circulation is slipping. I don't know as if uh, the Times, uh, you know, is going that much downhill because they have a large uh, subscription uh, base, mm. uh, but uh, you know everybody is kind of fighting for readership uh, these uh, these days. And uh, I do understand that the uh, the article has been downloaded about three million times on the internet. Mm. Well, it it does amaze me that the New York Times um, actually ran this story because I mean you know uh, uh, from coming from. You know, inside the newsroom for for many many years, I know that most of the time this type of subject is treated as a joke or with um, uh, with ignorance because most reporters and you know uh, uh, assignment editors uh, they have no idea uh, you know they, they, what's what's going on. So I mean that's why you see so many stories, especially on um, television news, where you know it's it's regulated to after the weather and they play uh, the X Files music in the background well yeah. this time this time seemed to be a little bit uh, different the the chuckle factor was still there to some uh, degree but uh, usually now it's like a good cop bad cop if there's a panel of uh, of uh, you know people uh sitting around the the desk there let's say on uh, uh, abc there's the weather guy the straight news guy uh the gal that does the traffic uh, at least one of them will say, oh, I, you know, I believe or we should investigate this. And the other two will uh, try to say, well, we, uh, we don't want to repeat the story again. Uh, you know, but it, it did get a lot of attention and a lot of airplay. And, and that's uh, good, I think, for for all of us. I mean, uh, well, OK, let's why don't we let's bring uh, Greg yes. into this conversation and see what he has to say. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> have you been have you been listening? Uh, Greg? I mean, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I've been I, listening. I. Can you hear me? Oh yes, oh, yes, yes. I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I've been listening. The uh, the I've been basically not saying anything about it, trying not to, and kind of just polling my friends and listening to them. And um, at this point, I've got three things to say about the that whatever we want to call it, I don't know, disclosure or what. Um, the first thing is that the people that are involved with it are all for the most part, at least the spokespeople are from the CIA or former CIA. Their business is secrets. Their business is making sure that people see things a certain way so that, you know, national security concerns can be uh, 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 taken care of. Um, the second thing is that, um, and I said this, and I'm not the only one, a lot of people have said this about this, the so-called disclosure, the only disclosure that this disclosure movement would believe is the one that they already had in their minds in the first place. If they didn't hear exactly what they wanted to hear, 
exactly. it would have been, they would have been screamed cover up. And the third thing is that I noticed is that every part of the story is conforming to the myth that has been built up over the last, you know, for, when I say myth, I mean the story that, that ufology tells itself, whether it's true or not or whatever, starting with, you know, probably in sometime in the mid eighties, um, really starting with Bill Moore kind of telling everybody what had been going on in 1989, uh, the X-Files in the 90s, uh, every movie that deals with the government and UFOs, everything they've been saying conforms to that that script and that myth. And I don't know how other people feel about it, but when something sounds too good to be true, it really makes me wonder. So this is why I'm kind of <laughs> not saying that this, you know, it's not true or not important. I think it is important because it changes the conversation a little bit, but ultimately, and of all people, Grant Cameron pointed this out on my show like four or five years ago. He said, disclosure's already happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's there for everybody to see. If you're really into the subject, there's all kinds of documents and all kinds of little bits here and there and all kinds of Stephen Greer for all, whatever you think of him Had all those people come up and, and talk Leslie Keene's book of all, you know, to 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 make a really strong point uh, uh, was specifically concerned with this matter. So, like a lot of people, including you guys, um, I think it's really nothing new, nothing really relevatory. The main thing that could happen, which which uh, a lot of people have been asking for, is you know what about this this alloy or metal or whatever they want to call yeah. it that they found? Are they going to release that so other people can look at it? So you know some scientist or or institution that is not part of their group can take a look at it um you know uh, there just has to be something there besides the vaporware that's come come out for for it uh so far so it remains to be seen we'll see yeah well right now all i have is just you know uh, talk of this you know so-called uh strange metal yeah, until, but you until gotta, somebody you actually gotta, brings you, it you, out you, you gotta realize that bob bigelow it has got a lot of money behind him. I, I, I and, and he's now uh, involved in the uh, in the space race. And I don't think he wants to be put in a position of uh, being uh, um, uh, bought out as as somebody who deals very loosely with the uh, with the truth. I mean, I, I think if he says he has some sort of metal, he has some sort of metal. Of course, metals have been known uh, to be uh, floating around uh, in the UFO field going back all the way to Maury Island, right, Greg? I mean, there, there, are, plenty, right, there are plenty exactly. of metals here. And, and then the, I guess maybe one of the better ones was the one that APRO uh, ha uh, was involved in many uh, years ago, some magnesium or something that fell from an object in the sky, and uh, was that in Brazil, maybe? Yeah, I um, think that's the one yeah, you're talking about. Uba, Uba, Tuba, Uba Tuba or, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah right. Yeah. I always like that name. Uh, uh, <laughs> also, I think there was some debris or something left scraped on a rock at Socorro as well. Uh, and and I ha actually, I have on my desk here, and I was wondering how it got. Uh, I believe I, I got here. Um, I believe it was given to me by uh, John Keel. It's a packet of packet of something. Uh, it's a packet of, uh, I guess, foil. I, I would believe that it's uh, uh, maybe this chafe that the uh, they used to send, uh, uh, throw out of the planes to uh, Chaff, kind of Chaff, gum yeah. up, yeah, uh, gum up uh, ra uh, the radar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it was it was sent under the uh, classification of. Uh, uh, well, angel hair, but it's certainly not angel hair. Uh, but it, it, you know, it, it came during that period where there were a lot of things that were being uh, shoved out of uh, UFOs, and and things have fallen from the sky. We don't, we can't, certainly can't deny that. Now, uh, most of the things, if they've been tested, they've turned out to be something that could be manufactured here on Earth. But who's to say that? Maybe uh, you know, if you're a test pilot from somewhere else you're not using some material that you would also use on earth. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, how do you pr prove or this proves something really is from outer uh, space or, or from well, there anywhere. Was an, you know? yeah, yeah. There was an article in scientific American, I think recently saying, well, that, you know, the fact that whatever ice, well, whatever metals they have and the ratios and the isotopes of the metal that are in there, um, it's not like we, the, the point of the article is, is it's not like we couldn't figure out what it was. It's, it's not really a mystery. 
but there was an interview, I think, with um, Valet, Jacques Valet, on uh, Skeptico a couple months ago. Yes. Where he spoke about some material that he had seen, and he said the, the point was that the ratios of the metals were not anything that could have been manufactured on the Earth, because those kind of metal, if, if I'm saying this right, will not alloy properly. Um, and that those ratios have never been found before, and that they don't seem to make any sense. And I think that's what I think that's what they're kind of uh, pushing at. I'm not a metallurgist. I'm not a chemist. Yeah. But um, my impression was that the ratios of the metals and the way that they're the way that they are put together are in ways that aren't normally, are either not normally possible or not possible. Nobody's ever done it before, and they I, don't know I, the, uh, the the you know the, the the procedure for doing it. I guess the whole idea of uh, getting a hold of these uh, um, metal pieces is so that they can be back engineered. Yeah, that's the idea that that uh, Tom belongs to the Stars Academy, whatever is uh, saying that they're going to do. They're going to use some of this technology and back engineer it. And basically, the Phil Corso idea. Nobody's really brought that up uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. of taking something that was from somewhere else, back engineering it, and making, you know. Mm -hmm. Changing transportation or whatever—that's um, that, one of their their goals. They showed some weird-looking vehicle that they would uh, proposed that's going to use anti-grav or I don't know what to uh, carry people further and faster and cheaper and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't specify how. Uh, well, Lon, have you? I, I know you're you're more of a cryptoid uh, fellow than a, a ufologist, but have you you followed any of this? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of believe they're being spoon fed from the by the government. Quite honest with you, uh, I don't know. I I didn't really haven't really paid much attention to it, other than what people have been sending me or telling me or asking me. Uh, I don't know. I, quite frankly, like you said, it is interesting that you know the New York Times did put this thing out there, but. Uh, you know, then again, it, when it comes from the government like that, they really don't have much choice. They got to report it. And, uh, you know, you're talking about this memory, this metal, this memory type metal. You know, you know, the stories of the Nittenall years ago, uh, this um, controversy that uh, apparently that this Nittenall or memory type metal was was part of the Roswell UFO Roswell crash and that the formula was missing somehow. You think mm. that has anything to do with this? Nobody's mentioned anything like that in connection with this, with this episode. Not, not that I've heard. Like, yeah. like you, uh, I, I haven't paid really close attention to it because like we've all been saying here, I, we, I'm not really sure it's that important right now. Um, something may happen in the future where there's something that really makes a difference and that people can see for themselves and that scientists can look at and say, yeah, well, this doesn't seem, you know, it, it seems to be what they say it is, which is something unknown. Uh, Nightingale, obviously, yeah, you, you, the, the provenance of that, I think, has been um, established. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but it's not a, out of the, you know, uh, the, uh, um, it's not out of possibility that humans could have invented such a thing, just like just about anything else from the rock. I think some, at some point, um, Ryan Wood was actually trying to find out how, you know, all these patents came to be for transistors and, and uh, uh, fiber optics and all the things that they said that came from, uh, they came from the Roswell wreck. So who knows? This is another iteration of this. Um, they're saying there's some kind of metal alloy artifact, something, uh, or things, groups of things that they are, using to further uh, human understanding of, you know, how to, how, how to build things, how to make things, how to, how to uh, uh, change our, uh, the way we uh, use materials. I, I think that's the, uh, the idea here with, with this. I, and I'm not exactly sure why they're saying that. Um, it would be nice to, to uh, have them openly give some of this material to, uh, to an independent uh, lab person, scientist, whatever, take a look mm -hmm. at it. And then but, uh, uh, but, but hold a little uh, bit more water. Uh, uh, but but certainly, be. but certainly holding on to uh, the bulk of the material because we know in the past how supposedly uh, mm -hmm. evidence and metals and things have been switched. 
So we don't. We certainly don't want that to happen. I, I'm sure that uh, Bigelow and the other uh, others involved would oh, not yeah. see that happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah a yeah. multi-millionaire is not going to have something disappear on him because if something disappears <laughs> from his property, I think he's got enough wherewithal to figure out who took it. <laughs> I, I I would believe so, but material has disappeared. I, we've mentioned a oh, couple constantly. of times on, on the uh, uh, on the show this uh, fellow Alvin Moore, who actually was a a, a friend or an associate of um, Wilbur B. Smith. We just did a book uh, on Project Magnet, and Alvin Moore had uh, supposedly a chunk of uh, metal that was shot off of one of the smaller UFOs over the D, uh, DC uh, UFOs, you know, during the fifty two flap, and he had put it in a yeah in a safe that supposedly only he had the combination to. Uh, but then when he went in to retrieve the metal to send it to Smith, it wasn't there. And to this day, we don't know, uh, you know, it did it dissolve? Uh, did uh, the uh, aliens, uh, you know, uh, scoop it up by uh, teleportation? Or did they put their hand through the... Uh, uh, the safe and, and grab it one uh, <laughs> a dark evening. Uh, we don't know, but it disappeared. And uh, and of course, uh, a, a lot of the um, a lot of material has been switched, and UFO footage, uh, you know, has been uh, returned with the uh, parts of it uh, clipped away. And it doesn't. Uh, who's to say that it wouldn't happen today as well? You know, but yeah, yeah you're right. actually had his stuff returned to him like 30, 40 years later. That's correct. And, uh, uh, Mysteri yeah. Mysteriously mysteriously left in the mailbox, I believe, right? Yeah, somebody called him and said, go look in your mailbox. And I think he went out there, there was nothing there, but then he went out a little bit later. And his, there was a package there with all of his photographs from 1966 or whatever it was, Santa Ana. Photographs that he'd spoken about and told people about, but he hadn't seen them for, you know, what, 40, 50 yeah. years. Yeah, I guess and, he had co and, copies, yeah. copies of copies or something, right? Yeah, Ann Druffel and uh, I think Robert Wood and a few other people actually took these photographs, scanned them in, and, and started examining them, and they said they held up under scrutiny uh, yeah. uh, according to his story, the one he told for years, and that the yeah. photographs weren't there to prove it, and suddenly they were. So that I, one I, had a happy I, ending. I think, I think somewhere on YouTube there is actually a 20-minute, uh, I don't know if you call it a documentary or an interview or a, uh, something from one of the UFO shows that... Uh, uh, talks about that in great uh, detail, and of course we've had Ann Druffel on, and and she's spoken about this uh, incident. That's that's probably uh, you know her her key case, I guess, that she's uh, uh, you know investigated uh, in, in very thoroughly, uh, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, we we certainly do want to uh, you know like uh, see what uh, uh, comes uh, next. Uh, uh, to me, it's uh, it, it's kind of it's kind of exciting. I mean. Uh, all right, need to, interrupt you, need to interrupt you here, Tim, because we have to go to our bottom of the hour break. So when we come back, we'll continue our conversation on Exploring the Bizarre. Now back to Exploring the Bizarre with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal, your hosts, Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. All right, welcome back to Exploring the Bazaar. I'm Tim Swartz, and uh, as per our uh, uh, previous conversation before the break, I just uh, uh, want to add to it that uh, you know, for all the people out there who are expecting all this information that's you know coming out, and uh, uh, was it Tom DeLonge's uh, a new organization expecting that? Uh, oh boy, the extraterrestrial revelation is you're going to be coming soon. Forget about it; it's not going to happen. The UFO mystery can't be pinned down that easily. That's just, in my opinion, too simplistic. And I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. I was just going to introduce our, 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 yeah, our mystery of course. guest. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> distinguished. Yeah, that's right. Distinguished mystery guest. Right. Well, we've got, uh, finally, we've got uh, T. Alan Greenfield on the line. Alan, Hello. how are you doing tonight? Where is he? I want to talk to him. He owes me money. <laughs> he owes us all money, but that's okay. We'll let him on anyway. And Harry Reid owes you money, but that's not important right now. What's important is things get done. They get done with a lot of uh, skimming and a lot of things. But, you know, if kids get milk, they get the milk. It doesn't matter as much. It's a different subject anyway when um, 
when somebody skims money off the top and the kids still get their milk. The point is, officially, as far as everybody was told for the last, what, 20 years, 30 years, uh, when Project Blue Book closed and the, and the Condon Committee concluded that, uh, contrary to its internal data, that uh, there was no reason to continue investigations, the government was out of the UFO business, the United States government anyway. That turns out not to be true. And the fact is that for whatever reason, uh, this rather small, by government standards, uh, amount of money, apparently some of it went into UFO investigations and, uh, and produced some very interesting results. Conclusions? No. I've always said that, uh, that any of us who've been in ufology or connected subjects for any length of time probably know a lot more about uh, what UFOs are or are not. Than, uh, than the government does, because it's always been a, a penny ante operation compared to most of the Defense Department budget, uh, 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 rightly or wrongly, uh, all the way back to, to Project Sign, through Grudge, through Blue Book, and through whatever they call this. Uh, but the denial is always there. At the end of each one of these projects, they say, oh, we're not doing uh, uh, UFO investigations anymore. And then a few years later, they say, well, we were uh, through 2090, but uh, in 2091, we closed it. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, to use Jean Dupentier's term, a long walk down an endless tube. But that's not about UFOs. It's about government. But, uh, you know, I can understand people in Nevada being upset with Harry Reid, but he's... He's history now. Uh, so you can deal with that or, you know, perp walk him or whatever. He's hardly the worst. <laughs> Joy, Joy well, the list, right? Yeah, yeah. Every, worst everybody crook out. In, the worst crook in government is the mm, of the mm, states. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Who did that? Mm. <laughs> and that I said Donald. Mm, mm, well, gosh. you know. Well, you know, nothing nothing ever really changes because we have the same kind of situation here with those in the government who think that this information ought to be uh, released on a wide-scale basis and that the public has the right to, and I use it in quotes, to know. I don't know what they're supposed to know, but they're supposed to know. And then there is another segment of the government who believes that <laughs> we should not be told because of whatever the reason. Now, it, it's come out uh, from, uh, I believe, Tom uh, DeLong and maybe from uh, Bob uh, Bigelow and those that are involved, those that are opposed to the release of this new UFO information are convinced that Satan, and I say Satan, is Satan. behind... Satan! Be gone, Satan. Satan! Satan is behind the UFO mystery and if we release this information he will be able to take hold over the planet now one could say it might uh, have happened already if one believes in the <laughs> forces of of uh, of uh, evil uh, but that that really hasn't changed because going back to the days of even major keyhole uh, what was uh, you know uh, what was uh, going on there was a battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness to either present this information to the public or to withhold it for fear that the stock market might uh, crash or uh, that the aliens were coming in to come and uh, 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 rape and pillage and, and uh, plunder. Well, hell, they do that in the government and, and, and in Hollywood. So what do we have to worry about the aliens? Uh, they, don't, they don't want competition, Tim. That's uh, what they're saying. That's what <laughs> Neither do the aliens. But that's not important. What is important is there's been a, a breakthrough in terms of mainstream media. Yes. Uh, some would call it the fake news media, but that's not what I call them. I call them the mainstream media. Yeah has given serious attention to the subject of UFOs in the past two weeks, the like of which I have never seen. I mean, there's always been, you know, the, the History Channel version of reality, which is if they don't have uh, yet another view of the Nazi war crimes, they, they do uh, some uh, 
ancient uh, astronautical nonsense, and uh, which I've been on all of their ancient. Ast- so have you, Tim? Now that I yes, think I about- have. Yeah. Well, I you uh, know I, is, I, 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 I I think the history cha- I I think the History Channel for the most part does a darn good uh, uh, job. I mean. Uh, okay, they they deal with sensationalistic uh, uh, topics, but they do do their research. I mean, look at this uh, uh, the series that Tim and I are uh, watch every Tuesday night, the um, Curse of Oak Island, and then there is the series uh, the series about Hitler's escape. I mean, th- th- most of those things are pretty darn well documented. One almost hopes that the the normal media would spend that much time on some of perhaps if not these subjects, some other uh, subjects, because most of the news today is in such capsulized form that if you cough, you, you have, you have, uh, uh, you know, you have not uh, digested whatever the, uh, the subject matter is. I mean, I sat there at night and, and watch the, uh, you know, the six o'clock and the six thirty news and all the events are so compressed uh, uh, that it's uh, it's remarkable that they can put 20 stories into one half hour. And that's the only time of the day that you actually see 20 stories because most of the time, if you turn to these other uh, channels, which have become overly uh, political, like CNN and Fox and MSNBC, you get the same three or four stories over and over and over, starting at five o'clock in the morning. And going through till after uh, uh, midnight, it's like there are no other stories in the whole world. And there are a few out there, and a few of them might involve UFOs, and a few of them might uh, involve uh, uh, cryptozoology. Right, Lon? Well, I, I guess. Uh... <laughs> well, what, what, what was there a major story this year that broke in the uh, in the uh, the media about either? Uh, uh, Bigfoot or Dogman or any of the cryptoid? Um... No, and then no. we all know it. It has it, and uh, unless something major happens, like there's a body found or or somebody seriously hurt from something like that, or there's a verified sighting that can be actually verified, well, then there's not going to be in the mainstream media. Yeah. Uh, well, did you get? Did happen. you get any? Did you get any attention on the Mothman uh, in Chicago? Did that make the press at all? Yes. Yeah, it, yeah, it did. Uh, you know, um, the Tribune did a story. I wasn't particularly happy with it. Playboy did a story, which I wasn't particularly happy with. Playboy did a story. Yeah, and was, uh, Mothman, was Mothman in a bikini? <laughs> he may as well have been because it had got better attention. But, it was uh, frontal Mothman. The uh, the Chicago Reader, which <laughs> is a local paper, that you know they did several stories in there. But as far as being you know disseminated beyond the Chicago area, no, that just didn't happen. Then how come I know about it? <clears throat> well, yeah, you know about it. Well, you're in what Indiana? And, no, you know, I'm not in Indiana. And oh. Yeah, I'm the one. I'm, I'm the one in Indiana. My home in Argentina, next door. Well, to Adolf Hitler, I believe the uh, leader of the German resistance movement. Well, it, you know, me putting on the blog. The blog gets a lot of readership, so it's been picked up from the blog quite substantially. But as far as the media actually doing it, and or you know, that this didn't really happen. Uh, well, I- uh, yeah, but I, I mean, it did get national publicity. I where I get stories related to uh, uh, cryptozoological uh, uh, concerns and UFOs and uh, ghosts and all of that is just by reading the mainstream press from across the world and extracting from that uh, what what appears every day. A couple of years ago, um, I got tired of hearing, where did the UFOs go? So I started running an average of one or two uh, cases a day. This year, it's been more like uh, oh, dozens of cases a day, more than I can really cover. And that's all from mainstream media. I mean, if you count as mainstream media, hometown newspapers, all, all the way up to USA Today, the New York Times, the Washington Post, all of which publicize this. And by the way, Tim, CNN did several serious stories on this uh, uh, 
supposed government agency. The point is they they all showed CNN, MSNBC, yeah. even Fox. God oh, I realize that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that that's a breakthrough because usually if it's something about that, they do a little ha-ha story and then they move on. There was one ha-ha story. I think it was uh, – the guy that does their New Year's Eve thing, uh, the Vanderbilt guy. <laughs> Help me here, but people, his name? Uh, uh, the, uh, it, it, Cooper Anderson. Uh. Cooper Anderson, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Related uh, to Anderson Cooper by, by a different That's right, yeah. Hey, father, but, but you know, you know also, too, also too, if you note it, that uh, directly after the so-called disclosure piece, they were showing meteorites falling from the sky and the missile taking. They were continuing on with the story, even though there were rational explanations for the next couple of uh, 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 items. You know, they didn't have to show the meteorites uh, coming down and the rocket uh, uh, going up with the 10 uh, satellites, uh, although that was, that was rather dramatic, I would say. I mean, that, that, was a, that was a good call. Everybody was seeing that out there in L.A. Did, did you witness that by any chance, Greg? You know what's funny? I am on a list that tells you when rockets are going up from yes. Vandenberg. And I knew what was going up and I completely spaced on it to, to coin a phrase and just sat in the house talking to somebody on the phone while this was going on. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen launches like that before. The weird thing to me is every time one of those rockets go up, people say, what was this thing? Oh my God. And then I point them to online. I say, look, here are videos. Yeah, and pictures of rockets going up for the last thirty or forty years. Yeah, if you don't recognize a good, if you don't recognize a good rocket, you're you're really out of the loop. I would say, you know. Well, when there's yeah, a major every once in a while, it's very street. dramatic. They set it up at at, uh, at uh, twilight, and the sun hits it just right, and it looks like it did this time. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Hey, so so Greg, I know you got to take off in a little uh, while there on your own rocket ship. What outside of the so-called disclosure uh, item in the Times? Anything else uh, kind of uh, hit you during uh, 2017? Uh, not really, except for the fact that I think amongst a lot of people that are into the subject, the UFO subject, they're a little less credulous and a little more skeptical now, which I think is a, is a good thing. Uh, as a result, probably partially of, one, the uh, Roswell Slides thing, which was debunked in like about a day, and the Chilean UFO video thing, which was debunked in less than a day. And I was kind of in the middle of uh, examining both of those. One of, I was in that group that did the, uh, uh, the, the Roswell mummy, although I did nothing because I didn't think it was very important. And suddenly it was. Um, it, what I saw was that people realized that, hey, maybe we should look at the background of some of these claims before we start uh, mm -hmm. crowing about how, how important it is. And I think that's a really good step. I, I think that, you know, some measured, uh, true skepticism is called for, not the fundamentalist kind that we're all used to. Well, yeah, the same thing with the, uh, uh, what was it? The, the Mayan or Incan, uh, uh alien mummies that, uh, uh Gaia was, uh, uh, promoting so heavily, but, uh, without releasing any of the background information on, you know, where they came from or, or, or anything like that. So, I mean, that's, that's another good example. It, it, it's just, you, you take a good look at them. It was like the, uh, so-called Roswell, uh, uh, body slides. Uh, you know, they, they wouldn't release a good clear photo till naturally enough till their, uh, big, what is it? $500 ticket event. Yeah. <laughs> so Once what, they what, did what that. do we now? What do we think about the uh, uh, the Navy's uh, this uh, uh, video uh, of this uh, tic tac uh, typed object that's been uh, connected with the uh, with the uh, the story? Uh, you know, you, you've always had the uh, UFO uh, 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 films that have uh, caused, I guess, a uh, uh, a stir in the field. If you remember the movie uh, that was released in 1956, uh, just called UFO, they had the two, the Montana film, and was the other one uh, uh, Tim from Miami, Utah, Utah, Utah. Oh, one, yeah, one was the Freeman. Uh, one was the uh, the minor league baseball the, the player or captain. Yeah, Freeman in Utah. Yeah, and and that that caused this stir. Of course, now. That wasn't anything remotely uh, as uh, uh, prominent in the sky as this more uh, recent um, uh, the gun release. Uh, 
Uh, I yeah. mean, they they were they were I, I think identified at the time as uh, seagulls or something like that, which they probably weren't. But uh, uh, it did cause a, quite a it did cause a stir. Uh, people like to see uh, photographs and and movies. I, I guess they kind of uh, validate the uh, the subject matter. And uh, uh, this one, more than anything else, uh, certainly seems to show an object uh, whose um, both description and its uh, a movement is, is certainly certainly different than anything uh, that we have been responsible for manufacturing, as far as we know. Yeah, the um, the the there's two different videos. There's both, uh, I guess, gun camera footage. One is of an object kind of traveling across the sky, and one is that tic tac thing or lozenge or whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the you know my my take on this is how many thousands and thousands and thousands of films and pictures of UFOs do we need before we realize that there's pictures of things in the sky that we we can't explain. The, the point of the releasing these things with the with the announcement was as you know support and window dressing for their main message. Um, they could uh, the, the uh, one of those films videos and the description of it has been around. Uh, researchers have known about it for the past few years, so it wasn't like this thing that it's just suddenly been released. It's just that the context of it is what was important. Yeah. Um, so we don't, I don't think people need to be proven to them that there's weird things that show up in the sky occasionally, but the context of how it's dealt with and what we've all been talking with here with mm. the, the media and how it treats it, that that's the big change. Uh, I don't know if it's good or that's, bad. Parts of it are good, it. you know. Yeah. Part, parts of it are good, you know. Nice to have people with uh, credentials and with, with some, you know, with some uh, a little bit of uh, outside of the field looking at it namely journalists, but maybe it can pull other people in uh, that don't haven't taken that subject so seriously in the past, and that's a good thing. No matter what you think of the message that's coming out of DeLong and his group and the CIA people he's with, the fact that, um, as uh, I think Heineck said, serious people are taking it seriously a little bit more is, is, is a good thing. Yeah, that's, that's the big story of the year, I think, along with the uh, unpronounceable... Uh, Extra gala- uh, extra solar system object. Out oh there. boy! Yeah, oh yeah! yeah, yeah. The, the Oumuamua or whatever it was called. Oumuamua. Yeah. That's very well pronounced. Yeah. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> they looked through a telescope and they said, "Oi, Oumuamua," which roughly <laughs> translated from the Yiddish means, "Oh my God, I think that thing's from outside the solar system." Well. Maybe so, but I think that may ultimately be the the big story of 2018. Well, where where is yeah, it I'd now? Yeah, forgotten about that. Thanks. So. Where, where, where is it now? It's uh, it past the sun, and now it's headed. You know, it's an immense solar system. It's headed back in the direction of going out of the solar system. But they're seriously talking about in the next couple of years. Uh, there's plenty of time. Uh, getting a spacecraft together that can actually catch up with it. And that, that is something that if there is anything more to it, it does is a, a cigar shaped object out there. Uh, yeah. Um, if they get to it and it's just a, a rock from another uh, solar system, that's very interesting in and of itself. If it's something else, and I think most of you know that I'm certainly not a proponent of the uh, ETH where it uh, uh, refers to UFOs or related phenomena, but I, that doesn't mean that I don't think the rest of the universe uh does not have any inhabited planets and that's the sort of thing that one would expect not flying saucers always seen near the earth but something like that a a craft that has gone so far and been sent for such a a, a long distance that uh that it looks kind of like a uh, a natural object only it's that's that's the only kind of thing that would survive uh the long journey between stars. So it may, it may be something of that sort. Certainly the, uh, the SETI community for lack of a better term is taking it seriously enough to be curious in that direction. So if they do catch up with it and there is any kind of evidence of, um, 
life out there or even intelligent life out there, that will eclipse everything else. Unfortunately, that's not going to solve the UFO mystery, but uh, yeah. tell that to the uh, to the general public. That's or well, you know, now the net, uh, one of the there's two more releases supposedly that the time uh, articles that the Times is working on. Right, one will be released after a New Year sometime. And I understand that a, a part of the dis- disclosure, I keep using that word uh, for lack of a better term. Don't use that uh, word. Okay. A small D, not a capital D, however. Uh, okay. A par- a part of the disclosure will be discussions of uh, portals, uh, vortexes, you know, kind of energy vortexes, and, and places where... Uh, it is uh, possible to see more UFOs than uh, in other spots, kind of like, I guess, uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, because Mr. Bigelow owned the Skinwalker Ranch and had a, a team of uh, scientists there uh, investigating the very strange uh, phenomena, which may or may not have been related to UFOs. But then again, it's all related to UFOs as far as I'm concerned. I think it's it's all... It's all the same a, a ball of uh, wax, and we've just we we just have to melt it down. I would uh, I would say, and uh, yeah, maybe I think someday. The other, will, go ahead. You know, no, maybe maybe someday that will happen, but um, who knows? Anyway, uh, uh, Greg, anything to tell our listeners? Uh, uh, I'm sure some of them are not familiar with your show. Where can they hear it? And uh, uh, what are you working on? Uh, the show is called Radio Mysterioso. Uh, you can find it at radiomysterioso.com. That's M I S T E R I O S O. Um, uh, I just recently had an interview with somebody who is uh, working on a completely different angle on exactly what uh, the Tom DeLong people are. And if you go listen to that, I think you'd be uh, very interested in what she had to say. Um, you, you, have, you, have some, you have you have you have some very good. Uh, uh, people on there. I mean, very interesting. It's kind of a an informal get together. We can always hear the ambulance go by outside. Yes, it's very <laughs> informal. Uh, and I'm working on a book with uh, Adam Go Rightly on the Contact E Movement. Oh yes, a is for Adamski, and that'll uh, be out in the next month or two. Wonderful and uh, happy New Year to you! And uh, thanks for joining us in this end of year roundup. Happy New Year, Greg. You're greatest. Thank you. Happy New Year to all. Exploring the Bizarre. Bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, UFOs, ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, worlds, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. dimensions. It's time to take back the night. night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. All right, welcome back to more Exploring the Bazaar, and we have with us tonight, Greg Bishop, unfortunately, had to leave us, but uh, we still have the incredible Lon Stricter, and, of course, the fantabulous T. Allen Greenfield. What? So, I was out of the country. <laughs> wow. Uh, the, word, the, word, the, word, the words just flow off your tongue, Tim. <laughs> Unlike yourself, Mr. That's Michael. right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Mm. You well, know, that, I have, I, it, it makes me always think of a line which I can't say it, unfortunately, uh, from uh, a Blazing Saddles. You know, where it says, "Oh my gosh, you use your tongue prettier than," and then I can't say. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So. I know the line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Tim. Go ahead. We can say anything we want on this show because Ooh, we're broadcasting live. Uh, through the courtesy of you can't say the, and that's one through, of them no 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 this is the internet remember uh we can say pretty much what we want because we're broadcasting live through the courtesy of kcor radio out of las vegas which is sin city so isn't this where we belong we are not subject to fcc rules we are, uh, we are, we are, we are, we come under, we are subject to D- 
TGB rules. <laughs> uh, well, well, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go blue this early in the evening, Tim. So we'll just. Oh, okay. That. Well, that that'll be that'll be the extra part of the show that we charge for, like some of our other uh, competitors. That's right. For twenty five dollars right. a week, you can listen to Exploring the Bazaar After Dark. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, <laughs> hey, I've got a treat. I've got something I decided to put together for the new year. Mysterious sounds from all over the planet. And we're going, thanks to Tina, our producer and station manager, we are, <laughs> we are going to play some of these sounds. And only I know what they represent or supposedly represent. And we're going to ask the gentlemen on our panel this evening to give us their impressions whether they be scientific or psychic or just plucked out of thin air so uh, this is my 14th uh, treat of the uh, year so uh, tina there in the control room why don't we start with sound number 15 <laughs> That's the heater in my old apartment. <laughs> is, is that is that is that your uh, final? Uh, That's my final opinion. I it sounded so familiar. I don't know how you got it, but I'm impressed. There you go. And Lon, what would you say? It, it sounds aerodynamic. So, uh, but I'm going to say it's a natural sound. A natural sound caused by. Hmm, it's hard to say. I'm just. I, I really don't know. All right. Well, Tim. Well, uh, to me, it sounds like, and of course, all these sounds sound like, it, to me, it's not like something from a science fiction movie. So, you know, it, uh, I, I would say it was lifted from, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Star Trek, something like that. No, this is the famous Taos Hum. Really? Uh, which has been uh, rec uh, recorded in Taos, uh, New Mexico, uh, in uh, Auckland, uh, which I believe is in New Zealand. And in Windsor, UK, uh, some people liken it to the sound of an underground diesel, and it's been repeated over and over for several years, but people hear it differently. Uh, some people say, eh, it's just a hum. Other people say it's nerve wracking. And I understand that at least three individuals are said to have committed suicide because the sound drove them crazy. Hmm. Now, that's that's probably the most famous uh, Fortean sound I would uh, I would uh, say right I mean uh, that's been on uh, talk about news media it's been on Inside Edition and some of the other uh, TV uh, shows uh, so uh, everybody I think has heard of the Taos Hum now here in my uh, neighborhood I sometimes hear a very uh, loud uh, I don't know if I would describe it as a hum. But it almost rattles the uh, uh, the building. And on certain nights, I have even gone out in the neighborhood. Now, I'm in the midst of all these skyscrapers and all. So it does sometimes create a tunnel of sound. I've actually wandered out at night trying to locate the source of uh, these uh, uh, sounds. And, and I realized that sounds in this, uh, uh, I call it the concrete canyon, actually can travel for many blocks i have realized that the hammer the hammering coming from the building three blocks away can be it can be heard in my apartment on certain occasions usually when there is a um, uh, a low cloud uh cover mm. almost like a temperature inversion mm -hmm. uh it, it seems to keep the sound down but that was the Taos uh, hum and it's uh been uh, heard by Numerous uh, people. That's probably the most heard of uh, uh, sound. Okay, Tina, number 14. Whoa. Woo! Oh, my God. 
gosh, my ears I, I are bleeding. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think uh, Alan, that's your radiator. No, no, I didn't say my radiator. I said my heater, and I my stand heater. by that. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm rarely <laughs> wrong. There you go. But how about this one? Oh, this one is clearly a recording of Jimi Hendrix at the second Atlanta Pop <laughs> Festival doing <laughs> feedback from those really huge speakers that I uh, absconded with. But that's well, another you, story. You know, I, I, you know, I think we don't have to go any further on this because you're absolutely wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually the shriek of Forest Grove, Oregon. What some people have said, have said is caused by pressurized gas or air. Where it's coming from, I have no idea. But uh, it's heard over a wide area. Some have taken it for a military uh, operation. And some say it's actually the sound of a ghost train. Mm. Mm. So, sounds, sounds more like the uh, chain link uh, fence gate that uh, we used to hang on when I was a kid. Boy, oh boy. that that That's a... Uh, you know, my my ears are rattling from uh, from that one. Yeah. Okay, down to number thirteen, Tina. Just came outside, heard this loud boom in the house, and the tornado siren started going off. Don't know what's going on. Wow, that was loud. Wow. That was loud. Lon, any uh, any uh, call on that one? You know, it sounds familiar to that sound that occurred down in Florida in this neighborhood, and people were sit- actually thinking it was a UFO or a landing of some type. I don't know if that's it, but that's what it reminds me of. Well, this one, uh, uh, go, go ahead, Tim. Any ideas? Uh- well, I was going to say it, uh, uh, to me, it sounds like a sonic boom. Uh, you know, when I grew up, we, we lived near Grissom Air Force Base, and at that time, they still allowed uh, sonic booms over uh, residential areas, and, I mean, we heard those quite a bit, but that, that's what it sounds like to me. Well, this is actually the Wichita, Oklahoma boom. Hmm. Uh, it's been heard on a number of occasions. It shakes houses rattles windows is heard over a wide area and some have likened it to a military uh, operations or a, an earthquake but there nothing has been picked up on the richter scale and the military uh, denies that it has anything to do with any of their <clears throat> operations in the area so that's the wichita oklahoma boom and it sounds like remember the ads for the old quaker oats the uh, the cereal oh with the cannon yeah that was shot from cannons yeah yeah I, think I remember those yeah I think it's the old the Quaker Oats uh, uh, guy coming back to uh, to uh, to haunt us was it now, Quaker Oats or like the uh, their puffed rice might well, have been their puffed rice cereal puffed rice yes okay but anyway that's 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 one big boom and um, I guess uh, people in uh, Wichita uh, have to uh, plug their ears from time to time. Anyway, this one, maybe uh, you'll have a little bit more uh, luck. Uh, number 12, Tina, take it away. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000 feet? No known traffic. Seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000 feet. What type of aircraft is it? I cannot confirm. It's full bright. The aircraft has just passed over me at at least a thousand feet above. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? No known aircraft in the vicinity. Seems to be playing some sort of game. He's flying over me. It's not an aircraft, it's... Can you describe the, uh, the aircraft? I cannot identify it. It has such speed. It's just vanished. Is the aircraft still with you? Now approaching from the southwest. It's hovering on top of me again. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. Ooh. Okay, well, this this is a part of a very well-known uh, uh, UFO case, uh, Alan. Um, would you recognize it? 
Not the specific case, but it was an air-to-ground transmission from a propeller-driven uh, small aircraft. It uh, no longer was seen to have disappeared. Uh, any idea, uh, Tim or Lon? I, I don't know what specific sighting it was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the guy sounded like he was Australian. Yes, now you're close. Uh, Tim? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, and I can't, I can never pronounce the, the pilot's last name, but that's the New Zealand uh, yeah. uh, incident. Yeah, right. That's yeah, v- 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 Valencia. Lunch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, somewhere um, amidst all that uh, rattling uh, sound is the sound of um, apparently uh, metallic sound of the object uh, uh, that was uh, pacing him scraping up against his airplane and of course he disappeared nobody uh, yeah yeah d- vanished without a trace i mean they've been looking for the plane in the body for how many years that was in the 1970s oh yeah yeah yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah they still never found him yeah he was uh coming toward the mainland from south of australia if i remember right there you go all right we'll we'll play one more for the time being and then we'll carry on our <laughs> It was Tasmania. It was in Tasmania. Yeah, Tasmania. Tas- yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think there were there were other. Of course, there's always been a lot of UFO sightings in that part of the uh, uh, the uh, the world. And um, in in fact, um, uh, there's a the only magazine published in English on UFOs any longer, as far as I know, that including 14 times, is the uh, Ufologist which is an Australian magazine that prints my articles every, uh, every issue. And it's sold in Australia on the newsstand. So it would be the only newsstand magazine in English uh, published anywhere in the world. And it's a fairly decent magazine, fairly decent. Anyway, we will go on to sound number 11. Tina, if you please. <laughs> That's the weirdest to me. I, I, I think that, 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 that sends, um, uh, right up my spine. I mean, I, that, that just sends chills up my spine. I, I just, uh, uh, I won't say freak out uh, because I've been listening to these sounds on and off for years, but that that one I, I think it's is legit by by all means. Uh, uh, Tim, is you want to take a shot? Yeah, it's I what? started saying yeah. Let uh, let t- let Alan. Yeah. Okay. It. Yeah, I think it uh, it sounds like an electronic voice uh, phenomena recording, a much clearer one than any that I've heard. Yes. Well, actually, now this is uh, uh, Tim or Lon. Any any uh, uh, guesses on this? Well, it sounds like it was a radio show that got interrupted by some type of transmission. Yeah, yeah. You, now you you you've got you, you've got uh, pretty well uh, pinned down here. This it was took place uh, in uh, England. Well, no, this one actually took place uh, in um, in the United States around 1985. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Starts off playing a classical music and then turns to some shrieks and someone reading a list of names. Now they've tried to ca- uh, the catch the uh, you know the the some of the names, and somebody suggested that it was the passengers from the sinking of the Titanic. But I I, I, I don't know how you could. Well, I heard figure- Rob, Robert Oppenheimer's name mentioned. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. Well, there is. So, I, uh, uh, yeah. I don't think he was on the Titanic. No, I don't even think uh, he was born yet. Well, he may have been. <laughs> <laughs> he, was old, but he was young and a very good swimmer. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and he knew how to play, and he knew how to play classical music and to shriek. <laughs> oh, I was th- I was thinking that was the one that was recorded, you know, when the uh, uh, radio uh, station in England was, or was it a television station? I can't well, remember. That now. Was, uh, you mean the Ashtar uh, yes. command? Yeah, that's uh, what ca- I was uh, came through. No, no, th- this one. Uh, some people, somebody tried to pin it down 
is a broadcast coming from uh, some college radio station in in New York, but nobody could ever really uh, prove it. It was pretty close to where the college uh, station uh, would be on on the dial. But you know, most of these college uh, stations are only heard uh, in the dormitory and maybe uh, a radius of a of a block or a half a mile or something like that. With the exception of WFMU, which is no longer college associated with the college, but. Hmm. Be that be that as it may. Uh, anyway, that's our first ba- batch of uh, fourteen uh, sounds for better or worse. And uh, let us get back to the uh, conversation of the evening. Perhaps uh, now, Lon, it is time for us to talk about cryptids <laughs> and okay. uh, Mothman in Chicago. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I don't particularly want like to call it the Mothman of Chicago. I I don't even think it has really that much, you know, relationship to what was seen in Point Pleasant. You know, it may be something that's somewhat related. I kind of infer that with the title of the book, but um, you know, that that was kind of what people were saying. They thought it may have been when a very you know the very first sighting. And, uh, and in fact, the early sightings did kind of even look like the Mothman or an Owl Man type being. Uh, but it kind of uh, changed towards a, uh, a bat winged light flying humanoid eventually. So, uh, you know, we had uh, all together in, in 2017. We had 53 sightings hmm. that I believe were authentic. Uh, you know, we had other reports and such, but, you know, we, you know, we had to kind of go through a lot of that. And, uh, you know, some of them just weren't reported by us because we just didn't believe, it, you know, it would be a witnesses. And, uh, but I, the one thing about it was, um, and, you know, our investigators all agreed that the um, the witnesses were fairly consistent as far as not embellishing on their stories, they uh, which is unusual in cryptid reports from witnesses. Uh, they would make um, they would make a report either you know by email or by telephone, and when you start to talk to them, trying to see, trying to get them to embellish on it seeing what they at you know they they just stuck to their original story well now is uh, has there been a kind of like a consensus of uh, a description uh, of of these things i mean 53 sightings that's 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 a lot of sightings yeah. uh, are they seeing the same thing or do the descriptions vary uh they do vary some a little bit uh you know from the early sightings which like i said before were kind of the owl man, moth man like sightings, as opposed to maybe forty seven or forty eight of the, the later sightings, which had the bat wing. But they, there were some type of uh, there were some uh, variations. Some had the red eyes, some didn't. Um, some of the characteristics, the way they, uh, you know, what they did, or the way they kind of presented themselves the people were different i i you know after i've gone through all these uh i believe there's at least there was at least three of these beings hmm. i just don't think it was one i think and you know the locations as well varied i mean there were sightings in uh you know downtown chicago by the you know also by the waterfront most of the sightings were there but of course there were sightings south of the city into northern indiana and uh then there were a few west of the city as well well i I mean there were there were at least a couple of sightings where i I know there was one uh the woman who was i guess pretty close to the waterfront uh one of these things i mean came down it was close enough that she could have reached out and touched it oh yeah yeah there was one sighting where uh this couple were um on you know near the waterfront they were on lakeshore drive and they were walking back to their her mother's condominium, which was in the, you know, which they were in front of the building. And this thing came, and it was at nighttime, and this thing flew in front of them, 
and up the side of the building and it when it got close to the top of the building it just hovered there like it was looking through one of the windows then it maybe about five or six seconds later it kind of arched its way arched back and swooped down toward the trees uh by this time the couple were literally running towards the exit of the building and this thing hovered itself descended down in front of them and just hovered there uh for about I'm, 15 I'm, seconds you know i'm trying to think i can't remember any you know like a, a recent events in such a large metropolitan area that has had you know uh, this kind of flap of uh, of, yeah. of cryptid creatures yeah, this is very unusual. This is historical, in my, in my opinion. I mean, there there were a lot of sightings in Point Pleasant, but uh, in, in in around Point Pleasant. But as far as having something like this in a in a major urban area, well, it just doesn't happen. I mean, you very rarely even hear anything about like that. Well, and I mean, there were there were a lot of uh, I guess unreported uh, sightings in in Point Pleasant as well. But yeah. we're going to have to hold it there because we're coming up to our bottom of the hour break. So we will return in just a few minutes for more. Explore the bizarre. Now back to exploring the bizarre with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal. Your hosts. Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. Uh, let's give ourselves a round of applause, Tim. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> how many? How many shows now? We're well over the 125 mark. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've uh, we've uh, we keep on we keep on trucking, uh, presenting uh, our exploring the bizarre audience with the. Uh, some of the most lively conversation in the world of the strange, unusual, and certainly the bizarre. Just like this evening, because we've got uh, several very good guests on. Fascinating guests who know the subject matter right down to the most minute detail. <laughs> in fact, uh, we have a stickler for detail, Lon Stickler, who's with <laughs> us this evening. And uh, always uh, welcome uh, Alan uh, Greenfield from the uh, Georgia area. You're still down in Georgia, right, Alan? I'm still stuck right here in Georgia. Yes, sir. And has the winter encased you down there? Not yet, but the forecast looks pretty grim. We had one day that we actually had something, that white powderous substance that comes from the sky. I don't know what you you Yankees Co- call Co- that. cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I knew yeah, you were going. When I lived in the US. <laughs> that's an entirely different story. Uh, uh, well, yeah, we 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 certainly will. I think we said it earlier today. Uh, we have been hit with a real bad cold wave. No snow here, but we're not far away. Uh, you know, from uh, who knows? The winter is long yet. It's only started. So yeah. I I I I, dr- I dread this uh, winter. But uh, Alan. You wrote, uh, actually, talk about Mothman, as, as we were just before the break. You wrote the introduction to uh, a book on uh, Mothman, The Silver Bridge, that Gray Barker authored. You've been fascinated with uh, Mothman over the years. Is that not true? Oh, it's very true. In, in fact, uh, I think um, that gray probably would have a uh, gray barker would probably never have published that book because he had such <clears throat> negative response from certain other deceased uh, ufologists named jim mosley who he valued if i hadn't uh, seen the manuscript and offered to edit it because i thought it was terrific and i wrote what i thought was a good introduction at the time but uh when the second edition came out no, oh, what, five years ago, something like that. It gave me the opportunity to write a new introduction, and that really um, is a superior uh, take on what Gray is getting at, which was uh, Mothman as metaphor. Um, and uh, I do think that these cases are related. I think that they go back historically a long way just as ufos and fairy lore and ghost lore uh similarly go back and uh uh 
come forward to the present day. And uh, whether they are harbingers of disaster or not, I don't know. The Chicago cases don't seem to be. I mean, I would have been worried if I were living in Chicago and there had been that many cases because we have the, um, this, the, the classics surrounding the Silver Bridge disaster, which was the name of Gray's book, uh, um, Silver Bridge. And uh, um, there was a few years ago uh, a, a very clear case. I think it appeared in uh, uh, Rick Hilberg's, uh, Rick and Carol Hilberg's newsletter uh, at the time. Um, uh, just before the was it the uh, Interstate 35 bridge collapse, and it was two people who had who saw a uh, bat-like or moth-like huge creature fly over, which they first called a UFO, but clearly their description of it was of a living creature. So it was an unidentified flying object, but an unidentified flying cryptid would be more accurate, I think. Um, in honor of this program tonight, on my uh, daily uh, blog, I did a, a summary today on my uh, Facebook page um, uh, about uh, specifically about uh, uh, Mothman type sightings going back to Thunderbird type sightings uh, um, among uh, Native American lore and uh, a similar phenomena in Japanese lore. I think they, they are of great antiquity. It's the cases that surround disasters that usually get the publicity, or as in the case of the Chicago cases, um, I think it's just the sheer number of the cases that uh, uh, gets the uh, attention. But I think, like you foes, they're, uh, they're a constant phenomenon. And you can read a bunch of individual cases because I... Uh, search through files extensively to do this long two-part uh -huh. my readers complain about uh, peace so if you care to go to the t allen greenfield facebook page uh you which is a non-commercial site you may see a great many of these cases uh, going back to great antiquity and coming right up to the um, the cases in chicago um a couple of years ago well, after I get, after uh, the show ends, I plan to uh, to do that, and I hope that uh, uh, a majority of our listeners will uh, do the same. Uh, uh, what is it listed on now? Is Facebook T. Allen Greenfield? No, it's Allen Greenfield author. Uh, my original page mysteriously disappeared because Facebook was going through that purge after they got accused of being involved with Russia or some other. McCarthyist nonsense. So they took my bigger page off, and now there's one that just uh, facebook.com slash Alan Greenfield author, one word, whatever that means. But that's that's where I'm working now. And well, we have, uh, with, with followers and subscribers, we have about 5,000. So we're back well, up there. there you go. You've almost reached the limit. Nah, I, I, uh, that's juggling. Uh, followers don't count. They count, oh. to me, but they don't count to, uh, to the, uh, people who run Facebook from St. Petersburg, Russia. Whoops. I did. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I meant, yeah. uh, from, uh, from, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. from yeah. California. Hey, uh, now they're going to shut us all down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There. Well, I, w I was shut down recently and I don't know exactly why they, ne they never told me. But uh, I'm back. I'm back up and running. Uh, something about the the fact that I had pasted, uh, I guess, uh, uh, details about some title or book or event or show or something on too many of my Facebook groups. But what are they there for? I mean, if not to share the information, it seems like other people do that. But I guess I just got caught with my. Uh, uh, alien uh, underwear uh, down. <laughs> but, uh, Alan, you know what I want to uh, ask you? I, I got an email from you today. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you, I had sent you a copy, of course, of my uh, book uh, on uh, the matrix control system of Philip K. Dick and the paranormal synchronicities of Tim Beckley. That would be me. 
and that since reading the book, you have had an increased uh, number of synchronicities. Give me a hint on what's going on. Okay, let me give you a little background first, if we have five minutes to do this. because Yes, you bet. Uh, You're talking uh, about my book. You can take all the time you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, first of all, this is a really excellent book. And my saying that uh, may be more significant than a lot of people because I have literally read everything Philip K. Dick uh, wrote, plus um, – um, and was very impressed that you got an introduction, by the way, from uh, Tessa Dick, although I think she may have uh, her own take on what uh, Phil was like during a certain phase in his life, not necessarily all of them. But anyway, I've read most of the biographies on him and even a goodly number of the uh, the uh, notes that he make wrestling with his mystical experience. So, um, um I mean, I've read thousands of them. So uh, when I say that uh, you've really put together a really good book focusing on the synchronicity thing, um, um, it's anybody who thinks Philip K. Dick was a person of importance ought to read the book. And if you don't, then you should read a couple of his books and then read Tim's book because – give the title, Tim, because I don't have a copy in front okay, of me. Okay, it's the uh, – the, um Matrix Control System of Philip K. Dick and the Paranormal Synchronicities of Timothy Green Beckley. If you go to Amazon, just type in uh, the Matrix Control System of Philip K. Dick. Uh, you'll find it. And a nicely produced book as well. Yes, okay. indeed. Now, about synchronicities, I have always had some synchronicities in my life. Uh, I, I read the ones that you experienced, and most of mine are a little more dramatic than that. I'll give you one classical example. Uh, I had a long, long since gone, but I had a, an LP of uh, Alan Shepard's first suborbital flight on a rocket, which was roughly 1961. They were in a hurry to do something because the Russians had already put two people in orbit, so uh, they were not yet prepared to do an orbital flight. Anyway, there was a record put out of that experience, but it's obscure. You might not, unless you're a big space space buff of many years vintage, you might not even know who Alan Shepard uh, was, although he eventually walked on the moon, and what the significance of that was. The big one that's remembered, of course, and rightly so, is John Glenn's uh, orbital flight a year or so later. Um, I'm not even sure if it was that long. But in any case, so years later, maybe 20 years later, I decided to take out that record and play it. And I always have the TV on. It's on right now, in fact. I mean, it's just always, the sound is off, but it's on. I just keep it as... Uh, sort of like a moving uh, uh, panorama to liven up my uh, dull existence. <laughs> but um, uh, in any case, I put the record on of this obscure early event in the history of the space program. And totally unrelated, apparently, on the television, a picture of a spaceship uh, taking off comes on and I turn on the sound and it's Alan Shepard's suborbital flight, the same thing that I'm playing the record of. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of experiences of that kind where two things that are, they, that they fit the literal definition of a synchronicity because two things that have no causal relationship coincide. That's a little more dramatic than a lot of them, at least as a personal experience. But of course, they, synchronicities are only uh, dramatic usually in the case of uh, someone dying and the clock stopping at a, at a remote location at the same time, which is not as uncommon as you might think. Uh -huh. anyway, so so I've, I have these and I, they're frequent enough, I don't even write them down. I don't take a special because I, they happen fairly frequently. Okay, so I got your book. I didn't expect to get that. I expected to get the one that you published on 
the teen ufology movement of long ago, of which you and I were a part. But uh, since you sent that, I guess it was because you know of my interest in, in Philip K. Dick and his works. Um, when I started, no, no, I actually I didn't, Alan. I, I had no idea about that. I just wanted to. You always share your books and information with me, and, and so I, I thought you might in, enjoy it. And I do think that I did a good job of putting it together. Uh, it would be the best book that I probably have done since maybe the UFO silencers, as far as I'm concerned, and one of the ones that has some uh, relevance uh, to it. I mean, I do think that there is something. Two synchronicities more than, uh, uh, you know, I think it ties in the whole UFO phenomenon and the paranormal. It, there, there's a lot to be said for it, and it's been uh, grossly um, misunderstood and also ignored. Anyway, go ahead. No, I'm stupefied because you're actually doing a synchronicity right now. That, you, if you did not at some point in the back of your mind, see somewhere that I'd written something, because I do write about Philip K. Dick fairly frequently, of all the books that you put out, and you do put out a lot for, I, I think, more than anybody else I can think of. That is true. You chose to send me that one along with something that was directly relevant to me. And you sent me something that was directly relevant to me that you didn't know was directly relevant no, to me. No, if I had known it was directly relevant to you, I would have asked you to contribute something to the book. Okay. So not only my is point. that itself a synchronicity in that of the books that you picked at random that came out at the same general time as, as the the book on the teen ufologists, yeah. me and others, um, you didn't send me whatever came out a month before that or two no. months after that. No, no. So you sent me that, and that's like he's my favorite author of all time, um, you know, at least uh, in the, the science fiction quote-unquote genre, although he does transcend that. Uh, uh, and what you just said about why you decided to publish that, which is a little outside of the – areas you usually publish in is precisely almost word for word uh, what I've been saying for years about why Philip K. Dick is relevant to the areas of concern that my readers have, which would be, you know, strange phenomena, unusual events, and uh, the occult and so forth. I think that uh, 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 Phil Dick uh, uh, pretty well uh, – uh, pulled those things together, which is pretty much what you just said. And I mean, that could, could, you could be quoting me, but I, apparently you haven't read any of that. So yet another one. Anyway, as I started to read the book, all of these were small. They were little things and I didn't write them down. But for example, I would, I would read a page of the book that said something about uh, telephone calls and I usually read a book a, a few pages at a time. So I'd see the words telephone calls and I'd dog ear the page. Pardon me. That's the way, <laughs> the way that yeah, I read. Yeah, yeah. And uh, look over at the TV and it would be having a commercial about telephones. Well, they come on fairly frequently. I wouldn't think too much about that one. But nevertheless, it is a coinciding that taxes a lot. Add to that that during the course, I didn't note them down, but I did make that, you know, those little marks, one, two, three, four, and then a, a cross mark, five. How many times I had that happen, and I even mentioned it on my, uh, on my Facebook page, um, that this was occurring. Um, it was 146 synchronicities. Wow. 146 yeah. during the course of reading the book. Then for two weeks following that, it continued so that it became 224. I believe it is. I don't have the markings in front of me. It, yes. it looks like a prison sentence, but actually it was just marking them as I went along. And uh, then they tapered off to what I would call my normal. Um, but that nevertheless, I would hope that people who read the book – First of all, I'd hope people read the book, yes. but they would share any any similar experiences that they might have. Yes, well, I would I would hope that they would uh, too. You know, 
Uh, in the old days, Susie, you know, I, I'm sitting here and I've got 40 file cabinets full of letters and postcards and clippings and stuff. The number of actual correspondence uh, from people uh, have, have dwindled. I, I don't know. I guess people are so consumed with other things or uh, too busy ordering uh, from Amazon. It it doesn't seem to quite get the, uh, the response that... Uh, we got in the old days when we were teenagers. Now, because it's gone main, more or less mainstream. Yeah. I mean, but but nevertheless, that doesn't make it not worthwhile. It's yes. it's, it's yeah. Yeah. well, I I would certainly let, let me like give you one hear. other example yes. okay. that I just just recalled, if I may, yes. Tim, because I know we're yes. running short of time, and we I want to get yes. this in. Okay. Okay. So Tessa Dick, who was one of like like me <laughs> or Phil. Uh, we've had multiple wives, not at the same time. We're not Arabs, but uh, uh, in any case, we've had a number of wives, and I think she was his fourth, if I'm not mistaken. Fourth? I believe fifth, Tim. Uh, am I right? Okay. Fifth? okay. Well, yeah. 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 Got, got me beat in that category. Yeah. Uh -huh. and didn't live as long as me so far. Anyway, so well, I guess I've got him beat there, but. Alas, he more valuable than I. However, that may be. So Tessa is a sort of odd name, at least where I'm concerned. It's like uh, we've got a lawn, two Tims, and a Tina running the, you know, pulling the string. Pull yes, the string. Yes. Pull <laughs> the string. So yeah. I read, gee, I'm really impressed. Tim got Tessa Dick to write uh, the sort of introduction to the book. And um, I went on to something else, picked up a newspaper, which I rarely do. Newspapers are just not part of my world anymore. And the first thing I come to is an article by Tessa, somebody. I mean, that's not a yeah. real common name. Uh -huh. And that was like within 30 seconds of having had that thought about, wow, Tim got Tessa Dick to write the introduction. Well, we will have to have you on uh, a show with her uh, sometime. That would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Okay. Great. Yeah, yeah. She, she's she been on the, the show, I think, what, three times, Tim, at least? Uh, oh, yeah, at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's a, you know. Um, I, the, one of the great uh, regrets of my life is I met many science fiction writers over the years because I was very active in science fiction fandom until it got too big for, for me to uh, enjoy. Uh, I like the intimacy of the fans and uh, professionals uh, sort of milling around together and having a good time together at conventions. When they got to be 40,000 people, I said, forget it. Also outrageously expensive, but be that as it may, um, I never met Philip K. Dick. Now, he was relatively reclusive as these things go, except for very short periods of his life, but I never met him, and I do regret that profoundly because um, – he transcends even mainstream writers. Well, uh, I, I hate to interrupt, but we are down to three minutes here. And Lon, you have a new book out, is that correct? Yeah, I, I'm right. I wrote about the uh, the Chicago sightings. It's titled uh, Mothman Dynasty, Chicago's Winged Humanoids. And, and it's out in paperback and Kindle on Amazon. Oh my, and how long has that been out? Oh, about two weeks now. Well, you have to send us a, 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 a copy of that, and we'll have you back on to talk about the book in specifics. Uh, and, of course, tell people about your, your blog and your show. Well, I, I write a daily blog at phantomsandmonsters.com. Uh, you can receive it daily in your email. We're at about 25,000 daily subscribers now. And uh, I have been with... Sean Forker and Butch Wachowski on uh, on Arcane Radio, but we are changing some things in the next coming weeks. I can't say anything yet, but we got a brand new show coming. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. It's a very interesting show, and you have some fascinating uh, information in that newsletter. I know I get it uh, every day. And uh, Tina, uh, thank you uh, for putting together all that uh, material, the, the, uh, the weird uh, sounds, and we'll continue on with them uh, in a future show. And Alan, the blog again, how do people get to your material and read your material? You know, I, I always say just Google my name and you'll yeah. find 
400 million things. I do have a new book coming out, though, very shortly here, waiting on the publisher to get to it. But uh, that should be soon. And if uh, they're listening in, I look forward to it. It's called It's called God Never Does the Same Thing Twice. And it's a, a strange book, even by my standards. Well, we have had, I want to wish uh, everybody out there a happy new year. Happy new guess, year. People. Happy new year. Uh, but we, we need to blow some uh, uh, horns. <laughs> uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, uh, and, and we'll all meet in Times Square, Alan, to watch the ball come down, even if it is 12 degrees. And uh, thank you, <laughs> Tina. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Carol. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners, and God bless. And uh, Sleep well tonight after hearing this show. You've been listening to Exploring the Bazaar with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. They're taking back the night by jetting non-stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained with you as their co pilot Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bazaar and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bazaar.